this week your handy dandy guide to Tuesday's big election. Has your fixation on the royals kept you distracted from focusing on all those pesky ballot questions you're being asked to decide? Well, don't despair, all is not lost. This half hour, your pithy and insightful rundown of the key issues and races on both sides of state line. Greetings, everyone. It's great to have you with us again. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. We at KCPT salute the Kansas City Royals, but we have business to attend to on this program and rolling up their sleeves, working feverishly to research your ballot choices. Our Kansas City Star political columnist and the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. If one Steve is great, two Steves are even better. On the political beat at the Pitch newspaper, Steve Vokrot is with us. From the pages of The Call, senior writer Eric Wesson, and he's been working like a dog this election season, but we promised him some KCP be two treats after the show, star political reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling. Now, let's face it, the race for United States Senate in Kansas has sucked the oxygen out of the room for most of this election season, along with the race for Kansas governor. So I don't want to dominate our whole coverage this half hour with that. We want some others to shine. But some final take-homes. Republican Pat Roberts arguing in his race against in independent Greg Orman that Republican control over the United States Senate is at stake here, not just one seat in Kansas. Is that still true? It very well could be true, Nick. Uh, the numbers keep changing. The math keeps uh, flipping here as we get down towards Election Day. But Pat Roberts keeps saying it himself. You know, the road to a Senate majority for Republicans runs through Kansas. That's one of his main closing arguments here as we head down to the home stretch. You know, in this final week, I'm um, looking at the ads that we're seeing, and it seems to be everywhere other than on public television, I will say, Steve Ockrock. <laughs> but the Greg Allman hitting on the attendance record of Pat Roberts while he was in Washington, D.C. That's what he's been hitting on. And on the other side, uh, we're seeing that it might be too much of a risky choice. What are we going to get with Greg Orman? Is that the way this is all sizing up in this last week? Yeah, it's, you know, Greg Orman's probably striking on a pretty solid note by going after the attendance thing because it lends its it lends this image that Pat Roberts has been in Washington too long and doesn't really seem to care about his job a whole lot. But I, th I still sense that a lot of people sort of struggle a little bit with Greg Orman, and he hasn't really defined himself that much. And he hasn't beat back too terribly well some of these attacks that Roberts has leveled at him uh, for some of his, you know, less successful business ventures. But the, the blank canvas thing, is that working for Pat Roberts? To, to a degree, you, you certainly don't see an enormous amount of enthusiasm, Nick, for Greg Orman, sort of the crusade mentality as we head into the final weekend. People who are voting for Greg Orman are making sort of an intellectual choice that, you know, we will trust what he stands for as opposed to what we think of Pat Roberts. Pat Roberts has relied on the argument that, uh, the Harry Reid argument, which you talked about, and he's brought in virtually every Republican senator that he can get his half hands the on. Half the Senate has come in as we tape this this Friday. Uh, the Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, comes in as well. Whether or not that helps him or reinforces the image of a Washington senator as opposed to a Kansan, we'll find out on election Eric. day. And I think that the attendance is what people understand because the race is you know, you get past the sleaze, and it's been a sleazy campaign on all sides, I believe. And I look, would like to see some reform in advertising because some of the information is inaccurate, uh, but it works and people go with it. But I think that it comes down to the attendance that he was talking about, and it comes down to do people understand the issues that his opponent is bringing forward. And I think that's what it's going to come down to. Yeah. Who can get their message out the best at the last minute? You know, Nick, the best prognosticators in the country are still on the fence on exactly what's going to happen in this Senate race. If you look at the historical statistics, if you look at a candidate like Pat Roberts, who's polling in the mid-40s, at this point in the campaign as an incumbent, they almost always lose. That said, this is an entirely different kind of race with an independent Senate candidate. Just touch quickly now on the race for Kansas governor. Remarkably, after all this time, polls showing this race is also neck and neck. Is there anything new to report in this race? Is it merely a matter at this point of who has the best get out the vote campaign, Steve Ockroft? 
Well, that I mean, that's always a big issue. I think the the newest thing in this, as far as I've seen, I think the issues have been hashed out. You know, the budget and you know some of Paul Davis's uh, issues. I think the newest thing was a uh, an ad that Sam Brownback aired about the Carr brothers, the uh, two perpetrators of a uh, quadruple homicide in Wichita uh, several years ago. Tried to link uh, Davis's support for some legislation that you know. He thinks had some implication on that, and it was really a dubious claim, kind of a stretch. I wrote earlier last week that you know Phil Klein had tried a similar tactic when he was running for re-election against Paul Morrison, and that was one of many things that blew up in his face in that election. Yes, Dave. Uh, I, one of the things I'm watching Tuesday is the fascinating geometry of how the Brownback campaign interconnects with the Roberts campaign. You know, do, do, does Roberts hurt? Brownback? Does Brownback hurt Roberts? Can Kansas Republicans vote against two Republicans they know very well? It, so I think one of the things we'll really have to pay attention to is which of the two uh, Republicans, well-known Republicans, gets the most votes and what impact each had on the other. You know, one thing you can't help but notice on this Friday is that Paul Davis's ads now have gone largely positive. Sam Brownback still on the attack that begins to perhaps speak uh, as to the state of this race as we sit here on this Don't Friday. think for a moment that all these exciting decisions are happening <laughs> only on the Kansas side. At the top of the ballot in Missouri, wait for it is Missouri State Auditor. I was just reviewing a sample ballot and I noticed incumbent Republican Tom Schweik doesn't even have a Democratic opponent listed. Is that a printing error, Eric Wesson? No, it isn't. He's running unopposed. And that was very unusual for that to happen because nobody filed to run and I guess they felt like they could give that seat up. Now he does have some third party candidates, a Libertarian and a Constitution Party candidate running yeah. against him, but is that because the Democrats didn't feel the candidate because he's doing such a fabulous job, Steve Krasnick? No, this was a political play, Nick, a very intentional play. Think about this for a moment. The Democrats wanted to sort of prop up Tom Schweik. He's the guy they want to face for governor in 2016. You give him a free ride. He comes out looking great. That bolsters his chance in a Republican primary for governor, if you're following this math. It's Democrats, once again, sort of playing in a Republican primary. Now, if you live in Missouri, did you know you will be confronted with four, yes, four statewide questions for you to say yay or nay to on Tuesday, so you're not totally confused. Here's a rundown. Amendment 2 asks whether the past criminal history should be allowed during a trial when a suspect is charged with child sex crimes. Now, proponents say Missouri is one of the rare states that doesn't allow it. More than 40 states permit it. Missouri is the exception. We've received countless press releases from law enforcement agencies saying this is a no-brainer. But there must be another side to this. What is the opponent argument? Anyone? Well, well, the, one of the things that's important in jurisprudence is that a criminal suspect should be charged and accused and tried uh, of a specific crime. And the argument on the other side is, to it, it, once you bring in evidence from other crimes, you're in essence putting that person on trial for something he or she might have done in a completely different context, and that's fundamentally unfair. That's the argument against allowing this Eric. evidence to be introduced. But Missouri has prior and persistent offender laws, so they go back and they get those records of uh, previous crimes anyway. The other side of the coin is saying that this gives Republicans and gives people opportunity to expand the law. Even though it's targeted now at sex offenses, it could expand to people that commit burglaries, robberies, and other things. So it would target and expand Missouri's overcrowded prison population. Mm. Okay, Open so some other considerations before you go to the ballot box. Amendment 3 relates to teacher tenure. Now, you may even have seen ads on TV about this one. It would set state standards for evaluating Missouri teachers based on student performance and limit their contract to no more than three years. Now, former Kansas City School Board member Dwayne Kelly wrote to me this week to say, this is, if this were to pass, all certified teachers would become at-will employees who could be fired for no reason, he says. Seniority would no longer be in effect. But would it really allow teachers to be fired for no reason, as opponents suggest? Steve? Well, it, it does erode some of the, the job security that teachers have. And this, is, this has been sort of a, a, a popular GOP plank all over the country, is to evaluate teachers on data, on test scores. Some of the principles in education are that it's not 
good education to just teach kids and steer kids towards good test scores. Uh, it's important to note that the primary backer of this, Rex Sinkfield, had funded this uh, effort to the tune of a couple of million dollars, and I, in, he suspended that campaign. I think he saw the polling numbers weren't very good for this. But uh, many people, though, uh, like the idea, though, that it would be easier to fire teachers, Steve. They do, and, and those folks tend to say they want more accountability in our public education system. Critics say you're making the job of being a public school teacher even more difficult. These folks aren't paid a whole lot anyway. Who's going to want to be a teacher under some of these very strict uh, confines that are being laid out yeah, here? Yeah, just briefly, too, the, the, in, in Kansas and in Missouri, Republicans believe that the teachers union is one of the last remaining strongholds of the labor movement in both of those states and they further argue that teacher unions keep salaries high and make it harder to cut funding or at least adjust funding to schools which is the biggest single thing that both states spend their money on and so this is seen by some as an effort to sort of break that union or break that union's influence as a way to reduce funding or limit funding increases. So for more schools. food for thought then before you go to the polling stations on Tuesday. Day. Amendment 6 would establish six days of early voting leading up to a general election in Missouri. Kansas has had advanced voting for a long time. You can vote up to 20 days before Election Day there. So what's not to like about this effort to make it a little easier to cast ballots in Missouri, Eric Wesson? It doesn't specify the dates and the days. It just says six days, and that's very vague. There's not a clear understanding of when it is. Not only that, but the funding aspect, since it's not defined clearly, is not defined on how much money would be able to be spent in order to do it. So it's a, a catch-22. It sounds good, but it's really not. But isn't it still better to have some early voting rather than there not being a perfect plan, Steve Kresge? That's the Republican argument. The Democrats come back and say this is very unlike what's happening in Johnson County on the Kansas side where you can go in on weekends, you can go in at different hours. This would be just limited to business days. days. People would right. be working their jobs. It really wouldn't be that much of an improvement. Democrats want a m more liberal uh, law here than what Republicans are offering. But but still, it's still an improvement than what we have now, though, Steve Okra. Still an improvement, but the concern from the Democrats is it's early voting in name only. It's only a few days, and that if this passes, uh, then future efforts to expand that, you know, will be greeted with the argument of, we've already done something about early voting, time to move on. Okay. Amendment 10 on your Missouri ballot would prohibit the governor from restricting funds already budgeted for education and other state services. Now, some people might go, yawn, why do I care about that? So why should we care about it, Steve Kransky? Well, this is basically about a fight between Republicans in the General Assembly and the Democratic Governor Jay Nixon. Republicans say, Nick, that the governor has too routinely withheld funds that they wanted appropriated, appropriated for various projects. The governor comes back and says, well, hey, I had to withhold hold those funds because revenue didn't come in as anticipated, so I've been forced to balance the budget. The only reason that voters might care about this is, is that Nixon says that if this law passes, it might jeopardize the state's AAA bond rating, that it could increase the cost of borrowing money. I'm not, you know, we'll see if that plays uh, out. It's right. complicated and convoluted. I might skip this one on the ballot. Why, <laughs> why should I think again about that, Dave? Well, because one of the great arguments coming up in Missouri is whether taxes should be cut. And one of the arguments that uh, Jay Nixon has used, or the tactics that he has used, is to say that if you cut taxes this amount, I will withhold spending on these line items, education and others, as a political way to push back against the tax cuts. And the Republicans have said, no, we we need to take back that authority to make those rescissions. So it's an important fight about tax policy and spending policy in the state of Missouri. Absolutely. I, I agree with both. And it it balances, it makes sure that the, the budget is balanced. But the interesting thing is what happens if there's a Republican governor? Then do we have the same issue here? Then does the Democrats come up with something to counter to take that? It's about veto. No, power. we could have another constitutional amendment Amend at that point to change it. <laughs> okay. Now, if you think, why is Missouri having all the fun with these ballot questions? Why doesn't Kansas ever have these statewide issues to decide? Well, on Tuesday you do. Look for a constitutional amendment 
to decriminalize raffles. You heard me, raffles, as in what church groups and sports teams and schools do to raise money. Steve Kraske, you mean to tell me it's currently illegal in the state of Kansas? And thousands of priests, ministers, PTA board members, school sports officials should be serving time behind bars? If you say so, we okay, could right. go there. You know, I, I think charities have been getting around this law for a long time, Nick, by calling the ticket purchase a donation and, and, and giving tickets away for free. So that's how priests and everybody else have gotten around this law. This law is not a huge change. It would affect mostly small bore kinds of organizations who want to raise a little bit of extra money. Uh, Brown, Governor Brownback opposed it the first time. I think he's on board with it this time. I haven't seen any campaign commercials opposing this, though, uh, Steve Vonkrot. No, this strikes me as kind of one of those old laws that remains on the books and okay. somebody gets around to thinking about it and thinking <laughs> we can probably do it. Uh, is there this. no small, small irony that Kansas prohibits it's raffles, but runs a lottery. I yeah. mean, and yeah. and and yeah. actually yeah. has Wait casinos on. in the state, but somehow the church raffle on Sunday is illegal. Doesn't make Alrighty. a lot of sense. All righty. Well, so don't be surprised when you see that on Tuesday in Kansas. Beyond governor, governor, every statewide office is up for grabs. Last week we showed you an hour-long debate between the candidates for Kansas Secretary of State, where Republican Chris Kobach is taking on Democrat Gene Shodoff. Uh, you mentioned earlier on, uh, Dave Helling, about whether uh, the race for governor and United States Senate are tied and their fortunes tied. Is Chris Kobach's political fortunes and fate tied to what's happening in, in the Sam Brownback race uh, and the Pat uh, Roberts race? Well, of course, we'll know on Tuesday. To some degree, the answer is probably yes. Kobach won quite easily four years ago, and he's in a nip and tuck race with Gene Schodorf now. But I do think that Kansas voters generally see that race or that job is a bit different from senator and governor. And there was, there's been great controversy surrounding Chris Kobach, as we know, particularly his work on immigration, but also voting rights. There's some people that believe that he's been too aggressive in sort of suppressing the rights of voters to go to the polls. All of that plays into it. But again, whether Republicans, and remember Republicans dominate in Kansas, we can't forget that, that there are more Republicans in the state than Democrats. Whether Republicans go to the polls and in essence can vote against Pat Roberts and Sam Brownback and Chris Kobach may be a bridge too far. Again, we'll see on Tuesday. Steve Bonkra. And of those three races that you mentioned, that this one has clearly been the, the, the lowest profile, although not by much because Chris Kobach uh, was at the center of controversy over whether Chad Taylor could get off the ballot, uh, which had implications in the, the race between race. Orman and, uh, and Roberts. However, Gene Schodorf uh, has not run a terribly visible and persuasive campaign against Kobach. One of the arguments has been that she just has, simply hasn't had the money. And is that because um, the races for governor in the United States State Senate, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, has sort of sucked the oxygen well, out of the room, hey, that she hasn't been able to get the money for that race? Partially, but I think it's also just, uh, you know, Secretary of State is not one of those offices yes. where the the responsibilities are that clearly defined for a lot of voters. Well, we should just say very quickly that it's possible the Senate race all in could reach $30 million in the state of Kansas and the governor's race 10 to 15 million. That means we will have spent $45 million on those two races. And that's year. right. And, uh, Democrat Jean Shordorf, uh, Nick, didn't help herself because she voted for the law that Chris Kobach uh, wanted to make it more difficult to register to vote in Kansas, to increase the requirements to qualify to, to vote in Kansas. She voted for that law as a state senator. That's undermined her campaign quite yes. a bit, too. Let's not forget whether you live in Kansas or Missouri, you're going to see thousands of judges on your ballot on Election Day. I exaggerate slightly, but there is an organized campaign to remove only one of them, and that's in Johnson County, where there's a movement led by a Johnson County Community College science professor to oust Kevin Moriarty from the bench. He's the judge, you'll recall, who just gave out the first marriage licenses to same-sex couples in the state of Kansas. How serious is this effort? Can be. You know, I, you know whether it works or not, again, we'll see. Uh, you know, that's why you have retention votes is when controversial decisions are issued, 
the people have a chance to judge. Remember, he didn't actually, it wasn't a court hearing, it wasn't a decision, it wasn't a ruling. He simply put out an administrative order that was, by the way, quickly, uh, you know, the Supreme Court, Kansas Supreme Court put the kibosh on it fairly quickly until they could adjudicate it. So we'll see if it, I don't get the sense that it's riled up voters one way or another. Nor do I. Has, it, has a judge ever been successfully recalled in Kansas or Missouri? Well, I'm not aware of it, Nick. I looked. Yeah. I, it, it, there, if it has, it's been a while. Steve? There was an effort once in Douglas County a few, uh, several years mm -hmm. back when a judge was... Which is seen, where Lawrence is based? Yeah, and, and the judge was seen as taking a lenient punishment on a sex offender, and there was a lot of talk about getting her off the bench, but it did not succeed. And there was one in Jackson County a couple of years ago for a judge, but it didn't work. And there's been some other things that have been leaked out through the courts about judge leniencies that uh, haven't worked. Generally, people don't pay attention to a whole lot of what judges do. Well, speaking of the gay marriage issue, the man who petitioned the Kansas Supreme Court to block those gay marriage licenses, Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt, running for re-election. Is that an issue in his re-election campaign, Steve Kransky? No, there's not much of any issue in okay. that race right now. He's in pretty good shape to win, Nick. That race has been completely uh, uh, no attention, given all the attention the other races have received. I, I want to mention there's a totally open statewide office up for grabs in Kansas, and that's the, for the Office of Insurance Commissioner, after incumbent Sandy Prager announced she was not running for re-election, which means there'll be someone new in that job, regardless of how you vote, and it'll be someone from Johnson County. Will it be Dennis Anderson, a Democrat from Overland Park, or Ken Selzer, a Leewood Republican. Why should I care about this race, and what's the difference between these two men? Well, one favors, uh, oh, oh, well, appear, appear, uh, favors the concept of universal health care coverage. Hasn't come out directly for Obamacare. That's a Democrat, Anderson. The Republican Selzer opposes it vehemently. The question would be, how active would either of these men be in terms of educating consumers about how to engage with the Affordable Care Act, depending on which one wins? And, and, you, you get the sense that a Republican Selzer wouldn't be too inclined to, to be too cooperative and, on and that. And some front. of that, to some degree, depends on whether Paul Davis or Sam Brownback is governor because expansion of Medicaid, the state exchange may hinge to some degree anyway on the governor's election. That will determine whether or not the insurance commissioner has a big or smaller role. Closer to home, light rail is on the ballot on Tuesday. Now, if you live in Kansas City, Missouri, but you might have a hard time finding the issue when you head into your local polling station. That's because a judge allowed the city to draft the language for the ballot. So being no fans of the plan's author, Clay Chastain, the city council opted not to mention the words light rail when it comes to questions one and two, which are the two sales taxes that would fund Chastain's 22-mile light rail line from KCI Airport in the north to the Country Club Plaza in the south. But what if voters say yes? What would happen then, Steve Okra? Well, there's no clear answer. The, uh, the mayor said in the paper the other day that he would advocate for not collecting the taxes. What I think is more likely is anytime these money, you know, money just pops up in City Hall, I think you're probably going to see a feeding frenzy for a number of different pet projects because this thing is so broadly defined and it can raise so much money. Uh, I don't know how much political will there's going to be to say no to that. So if the voters said yes, the city wouldn't collect that money and take those tax, that I tax funds? I, well, I think Steve is right that there would be a reconsideration okay. of the mayor's position, and we would see Clay Chastain in court faster than you can spell his name. Now, Clay Chastain so. was the main advocate, the one who put it on the ballot. Is there anyone else supporting this now? Not even Clay Chastain? Not no, okay. Chastain. And he was on last week, of course. <laughs> last week, we dissected the race for head of Johnson County government with Ed Eilert and Patricia Leitner. What would you say is the biggest difference between you and your opponent? Is that I would know when to say stop when I've made a mistake. And the biggest difference is uh, the experience that I bring to the office. We put that full debate on the KCPT YouTube channel for you to see again. But you know there are other top county leaders running for re-election. Mike Sanders seeking re-election for Jackson County Executive. Bryce Stewart is his Republican opponent. Former city councilman Richard Tolbert, his Libertarian Party opponent. What is Mike Sanders' Achilles heel, Eric Wesson? He doesn't have one. He doesn't have one? That's <laughs> no, why we're not hearing not as much with, about this race. Not with those two uh, that are running against him. You know, Mike has kept uh, Jackson County off the radar, uh, off the front pages of newspapers, news. So he, it's kind of flown under the radar, come up. You've had some property tax issues, but I guess they've gotten those straightened out. So he doesn't really have one. And if he does have one, it's probably the taxes. Steve Bolkrat? Yeah, there's not much of an issue in this race. The other candidates don't really have much uh, much support or groundswell. Um, Mike Sanders is going to coast to this re-election. 
In Clay County, there's also going to have a brand new head of government there. Incumbent Pam Mason was ousted in the Republican primary, which means either former Republican state legislator Derry, Jerry Nolte or former Democratic state lawmaker Jay Swearingen will lead Clay County. So much of the news is Kansas City, Missouri and Johnson County. Can anybody help me understand what's at stake here? Well, I think only that Clay County it has the classic problems of growing suburban government, but they also have <laughs> some history of pushing and shoving uh, in their politics in that community north of the river. Whether that changes or not after this election, we don't know. There's a lot of people who pay a lot of attention to what's going on up there. Pam Mason has been a very divisive leader up there, Nick. A new leadership under Nolte or Swearingen, I think, would be a whole new day for that county government and perhaps a good thing. But both of them are well, well known. I mean, it's not like they're neophytes. Jerry's been around for a long time, so has Jay. Yeah. And Clay County has this odd form, kind of this almost outdated form of government where they elect people like the recorder of deeds and the clerk and that's led to a lot of these political odd political bedfellows and you know perhaps some stronger political leadership could get uh, uh, from Nolte or Swearingen could get that ship to sail right. And that is our handy dandy guide <laughs> to election 2014 in our bi-state area. We did it, ladies yes, and gentlemen. Yes, All right. Yes. You did it, Nick. All right. You thank did. you very much. <laughs> Thanks to Steve Vokrot of The Pitch and Dave Helling of The Star for all your research. I know you did a lot of work on this program. And to Steve Kraske, who you can hear every weekday morning at 11 on KCUR 89.3 FM, and Eric Wesson in the pages of The Call. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.